Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Let's Talk Footy podcast featuring Toronto High Park Football Club. I'm your host, Shaheen. Today, we have, obviously, our co-host, Fiona, our manager of coach development, Emanuele, and we have a very special guest in Richard Bucciarelli. Is that how you say your last name, Richard? I hope I didn't mess that up. It's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, two, yeah. Two C's in Italian followed by an I makes a C-H, so you got it, yeah. I must admit, I asked Emanuele to help me yeah. out that before you guys. <laughs> yeah, no problem with it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for making the time on a Saturday morning. We really appreciate it. Um, before we get started, I just want to get you to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you work very heavily with Ontario soccer. So just a little bit about yourself so that the audience, the listeners can get to know you and then we'll go ahead with the discussions. Sure. Okay. So I'll, I'll be brief. Um, you know, my name is Richard. I'm a, I'm a sports scientist and, uh, and soccer coach. And uh, I kind of, in my career, I've kind of combined those two interests and those two, you know, passions of mine, which are fitness and sports science and, and soccer. So I run a company uh, called Soccer Fitness. We've got a, a, a training center in Vaughan where we provide fitness training to athletes. We've got some interesting, you know, equipment and technology there, including some very fast treadmills, which maybe I'll talk a little bit later about. Um, I also, uh, so I am a, a, a university lecturer and, and, and researcher. I'm, I'm trying hard to finish my PhD. I had a, a bit of a speed bump because of COVID, but working on that. And, and I do, uh, uh, I, I'm a part-time professor at the University of Guelph Humber. My PhD nice. is at the University of Guelph. So I've got a bit of a, a connection there. And uh, I'm also a, a coach educator. So I, you know, I, I like to teach you know, sports science, but I really like to teach applied sports science to soccer. It's actually how I met uh, Emanuele a couple of years ago. So um, I, I work with uh, Canada soccer and Ontario soccer, uh, providing a different uh, coach education in their licensing courses. And also a course that I created about six years ago called the Soccer Fitness Trainer Diploma Course, which specifically teaches coaches about kind of a, a broad range of topics around fitness and uh, fitness training testing and sports science in general it kind of it teaches coaches what, what, what I would say in my opinion is a bit of a missing piece in coach education here in Canada which is the physical side of the game it's not really taught a lot in the licenses that's why I created the course and, and yeah I guess in a nutshell I guess that that's that's what I do so yeah no listen uh, thank you for that explanation uh, as a coach myself personally uh, that this is one of the areas where it's one of my weaknesses to be honest so uh, i'm actually currently doing my youth lessons but eventually after this that's finalized i'm looking into enrolling one of those courses so that i can learn more because um, obviously in today's world in today's game you know uh, sports science and fitness is, is a big factor in the game and you know it's good for coaches I, that don't have the background in it to enroll in those licenses to to learn a little bit more to be educated on that so yeah great <laughs> great to hear Emmanuel do I have any questions to start us off uh, particularly I would say now that we are returning to training hopefully next week what do you suggest coaches and players be aware of? So it's a good question. So that the, the, the probably the most important thing, uh, and then, you know, again, I, I teach this in, in my courses and stuff, so I'll try to be brief about it. But the most important thing is training load. And that's the, the, the load, the, we can call it the uh, physiological and mechanical load that, that players experience when they train. So if you're in a normal training routine, maybe with, you know, rep teams and stuff, you might be on, on the field three, four times a week, you know, three training sessions, one game. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Um, that's sort of what these players may have been accustomed to, you know, a year and a half ago. Uh, and of course, there's been all kinds of interruptions. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what, you know, you guys did with Hyde Park, but, you know, in the summer, a, a lot of, you know, leagues didn't happen. There was some training outside. Then you had another lockdown in the fall then a full lockdown in the winter. And, and now of course we're coming out of that. So, so what that means is that, that throughout that time, most likely players fitness levels have gone down and their capacity for training load because their fitness level is lower. Their capacity for training load is also much lower than it would normally be. So if you go back to doing exactly what you did before, the chances are that the players are not going to be prepared for it, which means the likelihood of injury is much higher. So how do you know, and, and this is the key about training load. So 
Um, uh, there's a simple way that, that it can be measured. And if you, if you use this method of measuring training load, then you can like sort of look at that and compare that, what you've measured from your training against what you want it to be. So what you want your training load to be is going to have to be lower than what it was. And, you know, if you didn't measure it before, then that's okay. But you, know, you can still try to figure it out. You, you, you probably are going to want your training load to be anywhere from 15 to 30% lower than what it was. And that's to account for the players not being fit. So how is it measured? Um, yes. You need to take volume and multiply volume by intensity. So volume is easy to measure. Volume is literally just the amount of time that the players are active or training. You can do that with you or your assistant coach or manager with a stopwatch. Start the watch every time the players are moving on the field. Stop it every time there's a water break. Typically, in a 90-minute training session, you might see 60 minutes of acti activity, 70, 75, I mean, somewhere around there. If it's lower than, you know, if it's closer to 50%, that's probably a problem. That means you're talking too much, but, you know. But in any way, in any case, that's volume. And then intensity, that's specific to each player. There's lots of ways to do it with technology, but the way we teach it, you know, to, again, to coaches in, in, in any environment, whether you, you know, maybe you don't have the time or the resources or whatever for the technology, all you need to do is ask every player how hard the training session was on a scale from zero to 10. Zero being rest, 10 being maximal. So typically it's not even zero to 10, it's one to 10. And, and that is, again, it, it requires a little bit of effort. You got to make yourself a little spreadsheet with players' names as, as rows and columns for days of the week and, and, and literally go and ask each player after training. It doesn't take a long time. It might take only five, 10 minutes and record those numbers. So for each player, their training load was the intensity measure. That's the number from one to 10. Let's just say it was six and the volume, the number of minutes. You multiply the intensity and the volume, and then you get a number, which is training load for the player. Once you've measured that, then you can check those numbers against what you wanted it to be. And as I said, the best, it's, it's a rough estimate, but the best est, uh, you know, kind of guess as to you know, how much you should decrease training load because of the inactivity and probably lack of fitness of the players is about 15 up to 30%, up to about one third. You want them to do about, you know, two thirds of what they had been doing before. And, and over, sense. yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's awesome, actually. And over time, I guess, as week weeks pass uh, into the training, um, we, you start increasing these and, and then it should be a 5% less, 10% less, and then you start bringing it up to the level that you want it to be, correct? Yeah, so, so that you're exactly right. And that's, uh, again, now we're getting into periodization. So, so and, and this is, uh, I'll say that like without measuring and monitoring training load, you really can't do periodization because you don't know, you know, I, I use a quote in the course. I say, you know, Yogi Berra, he's a baseball player, but he said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll wind up someplace else. Yeah. And I find it's, it's, it's a funny kind of quote, but, but, it, but it's really relevant to, to, to planning. So you, you have to monitor because that's how you know, you know, where you're at and, and basically what the level is of the, of the players and how they're, how they're responding to your training. But then with periodization, typically, if you're going to go from, I mean, you, you can almost like in soccer, it's easy because you can go one week at a time. Typically there's one game at the end of the week. So you can kind of plan one week at a time. What you don't want is you don't want to make increases in training load from one week to the next that are greater than about 5%, maybe 10%. If you start to make increases in training load from one week to the next that are greater than 10%, then again, you're, you, all you're doing is you're, you're asking the players to do something that they don't have the capacity to do right then and there. Some of them will do it. Some of them will get sick or get injured. Yeah. So the way to minimize, you know, overtraining, sickness and injury, the way to minimize it is to make small, gradual increases in training load. And again, the only way, like, you can't just say, well, you know, we played uh, 5v5 for 20 minutes today and next week we're going to play 5v5 for 25. That's not it because that's only looking at volume. You need to see how the players responded. And that's where that RPE, it's literally, there's an acronym that says rating of perceived exertion, that scale from one to 10. That's yeah. where that comes in because like Shaheen, if you and I, you know, are not at the same fitness level, and we both played, you know, 25 minutes. I didn't experience that 
the same way that you did. And yeah. The only way to know it is to check. So my question is, sorry, Emmanuel, I know you have a question, but before I forget, so obviously at a club like ours, we don't have the technology to measure that intensity. So we have to rely on the player's input. And I don't know, maybe Fiona can jump in here, but like I've been a player myself sometimes, you know, if I want to impress the coach, instead of saying I was going at a six intensity, I'll say eight. Yeah. So like how reliable uh is, do we just solely have to trust our players that they're being honest with us? Is there something that we can do to manage that? So it's a good question. So I, and, and I'll tell you, you will experience two types of dishonesty. You will experience either the players who want you to think that they're fitter than they actually are, yes. in which case they're going to give you a lower number. You give them a very hard session. It should have been nine out of 10, but they're going to say it was only a six because they want to impress you, right? Yes. Or... You're going you're gonna to deal with the players who um, they just don't want to train very hard. And so even though you gave them a light session, which was only should have been only a six, they're going to say it was a nine. So that way, the next training session, you're going to decrease the load. So, so unfortunately, yes, uh, like players maybe not being honest. And maybe also sometimes it's not even, you know, maybe they, they don't quite understand yet exactly, exactly. what it means. So, so the, the, there is always going to be an issue with, with reliability, of course. Um, so I guess my, my only answer to that is that the first thing is you have to communicate with your players about how important this is that, that they're that they're honest. That that's that's the, the you know the foundation of, of of doing this type of work. Of course, if everyone's just going to lie or if everyone's not going to take it seriously and just throw out a number to, just to do it, then yeah, it's it's not really valuable. It's not really reliable. The data isn't meaningful. But that's where again, just like you. You might ask your players to take a journal after the game, or you might ask them to do soccer homework, or, you know, the, there's other thing, you know, of course you want them to be accountable when they're training, you want them to have a good work ethic. So this is the same. So I, I think really it's, if, if you do a good job communicating to your players, you'll, you'll get much better reliability. Um, you know, the, the other thing I would say is unfortunately, as you said, I mean, if you don't want to invest in heart rate monitors or whatever, you know, then there's nothing else you can do, but really, I mean, <laughs> so, yeah. so it's, it's, it's the best possible option. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, again, um, because you need to know what the player's actual response to the training was. And with a yeah. heart rate monitor, that's a physiological measurement, but without it, you have to, you know, they have to tell you, you know, how, how hard it was and, and how they experienced it. And I'll tell you one thing that there's, there's quite a lot of research that's been done with this. Even I, I did some uh, with my masters. Um, if you look like when players are being honest, if you look at the, the relationship or the correlation between that number from one to 10 and, and exercising heart rate, you do see a pretty strong correlation. So as I, I think if you communicate well to the players and you get them on your, on your side, on your team with it, yeah, on how important yeah. it is, then you can get good, valuable information from it. So. Yeah. So it's the coach's responsibility, responsibility to uh, show the value to the players, to transfer the message to them, make them understand why we're doing it and how we should do it. And then uh, obviously get that feedback from the players. Exactly. I was, just, I was super curious because you were talking a little bit about um, measurement of fitness. And in my experience, the only way I've been measured to see how fit I was, was, you know, the beep test, the mile run, the stretching, that kind of stuff. Like, is that an accurate way of measuring fitness? And so I'll add a little piggyback question. Do you think that it's appropriate to use those in even, even in school settings when you're like competing against other people that you may not know, like, is that a fair way of, you know, um, getting people's fitness levels? Okay, good question. So, so yeah. um, uh, assessing fitness uh, is definitely very important for, for coaches. And and I mean, I'm a I'm a fitness guy, so I'm maybe a little bit biased about it. I, I don't even think it's really a problem, even with younger players. Um, you know, to, to to do let's say a, a yo-yo test, for example. Um, the key is choosing the right test. We talk about this in the course. Primarily, you, you want to, there's two criteria for a test. One is validity and the other is reliability. So validity has to do with, is the test measuring what you really want it to measure? So I know, you know, Fiona, you mentioned beep test and also like, a, was it a one mile run? Yeah. 
So th those are, uh, and, and, and when we talk beep tests, we're talking just the continuous beep test, not the yo-yo test that has a red. Yeah, so, so it's interesting that you mentioned it because when, when we talk about validity, both the beep test, which is a continuous shuttle run, no breaks, right? Or a one mile run, of course, is you know how fast you can run a mile or there's maybe the Cooper test you might know of, the 12 minute run. Those are, so those are all continuous tests. You're continuously moving. They're good to measure endurance of an athlete if you just want to see like kind of general fitness they're not as good well good they're not as valid as a measure of fitness for soccer and the reason is that in soccer like soccer is not a continuous sport soccer is an intermittent sport where you run you rest and you run again and most sports to be honest most team sports are like that and so this is why this yo-yo test which you know everybody hates it, I guess, but, but th this is why the yo-yo test was created. It's a version of the beep test that has a shuttle run and then a 10 second rest period. So that's an intermittent test. That's a much better test, much more valid for soccer because it looks a lot more like the activity pattern looks a lot more like what you do in soccer. And it, don't take my word for it. This is, you know, the evidence is very clear. It's been researched for over 20 years. The, uh, the, amount of running the distance covered that players do in that yo-yo test is very well correlated to the distance that they can run at a high intensity in games. I remember, I can tell you just, you know, one time that we, we, we looked at this with the, with the women's national team and we found some players, I mean, it was almost a one-to-one, -one, like they ran 2000 meters in the test, right fullback ran about 2200 meters at high intensity in a game. So it's, it's a really good predictor of the amount of running you can do in a game. So what tests you want, you want validity and then reliability. I know Shaheen, we kind of touched on that with the RPE and stuff. So reliability basically just means, uh, do you get consistent scores if you do the test multiple times? So some tests, I mean, you know, Cooper test is fairly like, these are, these are all reliable too. Like, like the beep test is also very reliable, but there are some tests that maybe have, you know, fancy blinking lights and, I don't know, some obstacle course thing or something that's difficult to set up. And you don't always get good reliability with some of those types of tests, but the yo-yo test, the reliability is also excellent from one test to the next and even between one tester and another. So again, I, I mean, I'm biased, but I, that test is the best one for sure. Um, your second part of your question, Fiona, was about like, you know, is it a good idea to run these tests even, let's say outside of soccer, but in a school setting? So me personally, I, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with it. I, I actually, I mean, I'm, I'm not a phys ed teacher, but I am, you know, working in the faculty of kinesiology. And I, and I, I think, I, I just don't know what children are doing in gym class these days. I'm not so sure. I mean, I'm hearing all kinds of stuff that like they just get into a class and the teacher just drops a ball down and goes and reads a book or something. And I just, I'm, I'm a little like hesitant, like, like I don't mind of course, I don't think children should be punished for not getting a good score on a fitness test. But, you know, you have math tests, you have reading comprehension tests. There's, there's nothing wrong with a fitness test. And I, and I would say if, if there's kids in, in a gym class or soccer players or whatever that don't get a great score on the yo-yo test, well, what do they need? They need homework. They need, uh, you know, maybe, you know, the, a, a little running program or some type of aerobic exercise program. And maybe they need to be encouraged to exercise more so they can get better. So my personal opinion, I, I, I actually, I, I don't mind using it. And, and there is even a, there's a, like a youth or a children's version of the yo-yo test, which instead of using a 20 meter distance, uses a 16 meter. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to you know, assess fitness. I don't really don't mind using it even with, with younger kids. So. <laughs> Uh, Richard, you, so you cover all these different types of tests that don't require a lot of uh, equipment and stuff in the courses that you teach, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. so we have there's a, there's a module on fitness assessments, and and uh, you know basically what we do is we sort of look at identifying well, okay, what are the key physical abilities that you need in soccer, and and that one the, the so the, the ability that the yo-yo test measures, yeah, and, and it's, it's actually it's the name of the test. The actual name of the test is the intermittent recovery test. And that name kind of gives you a hint as to what's it measuring. It's measuring your ability to recover in between intermittent exercise. So if yeah. you have good recovery, you have a strong aerobic system, you can recover well between each of the runs, you can last longer. And that's exactly the way it is in soccer. So a player who has poor recovery, those are the ones that, you know, in the second half, 
they start to get tired and they need to be substituted because they literally cannot continue to recover. So that's a key ability, recovery. There's other key abilities. There's acceleration. That's more or less your ability to start from a low velocity or no velocity. It all start from a standing start and, and, and increase velocity very quickly. Typically that's measured with a short distance sprint. Maybe you know, in our course, we teach 10 meters, a short yeah. sprint. And then there's maximal speed and maximal speed is over a longer distance. So, you know, we kind of go through what are the key physical abilities that, that are required in soccer, how to test for them with tests that are valid and reliable. And if you choose good tests that are valid and reliable, then, then, then you're good. And I'll say also, uh, cause I know maybe, uh, you know, we kind of touched on this is like, um, you know, there is a return to play happening right now. Of course, we, we would expect players' fitness to be lower. You can look at their training load because, of course, you know their training load is going to be a reflection of how they're responding to training. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing a fitness test now or in the first couple of weeks. Of course, the scores will be lower. So you, you don't – like I, I think one of the keys with testing is, is putting the results into perspective. So no player should ever feel like they're going to get cut or they're going to get punished – because they don't have a good score. Doesn't matter, even at the top level, that, that doesn't happen. If a player doesn't have a good score at the top level, then we immediately, we intervene. We say, uh, you know, it happens sometimes. The national team, you got a player recovering from a knee injury or something and they've lost some speed. You don't, you don't cut them. You give them some extra training to rehab. You give them some extra running so they can get caught up. And, and especially when we're dealing with kids and youth, as long as those test results are put into perspective, it's very good to know. I mean, if I was a coach with a young team right now coming back, I would want to know how fit they are because that's going to help me to plan their training. And if I don't know, I may make mistakes with my planning. So, Yeah, 100%. Emmanuel, do you have anything to add? I have no. a few questions, but I want to... Uh, no, I was uh, thinking about uh, the yo-yo uh, recovery test because that's, uh, I've done it uh, in the past myself too with the different teams back in Italy. And I know there is a two different tests, uh, right? And there is a level one and level two. Yeah. So the level one, it's more for the aerobic capacity and level two, it's more, a little bit more anaerobic capacity, right? Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, Can you maybe expand a little bit more on that? Sure. So, and, and I, I, um, I would say we've got to keep in mind that this is relative to the abilities of the players. Um, so uh, basically the, the, the setup of the test with level one and level two is the same. It's a 20 meter shuttle run with a, five meters there and back so we'll call it 40 meters of running with 10 meters of walking and that 10 meters walking is always 10 seconds so the setup the shape of the test is the same the difference is the level one test starts at a much lower velocity and progresses much slower to get to higher velocities or speeds the level two test starts at a higher velocity and progresses much faster to get to higher speeds so um, both tests more or less are measuring recovery because of course, no matter what, you're still sprinting and then resting. It's still a measure of recovery, but what you said, Emanuele is correct. So, so basically, uh, that's the best way to put this. So the difference between the aerobic and the anaerobic energy systems. So the aerobic energy system is the system in which you use the oxygen that you're breathing in to generate energy. And in soccer, that system works by recovering in between running. Wow. Uh, it doesn't work well with low intensity. Like the aerobic system, actually, the intensity of exercise is still high, but it's not as high as the intensity would be with the anaerobic system. Because the anaerobic system is a system in which you generate energy without using the oxygen that you're, care that you're taking in. So primarily, you're generating it either from energy that's stored in your muscles or from, well, actually, actually it's always something that's stored in your muscles. It's either creatine or glucose basically. So, so in any case, um, back to the test, because the level one test starts at a lower speed and progresses more slowly, the intensity, it's still high, but it's lower in that test than it is in the level two test. In the level two test, the intensity is much higher. So you have to recover in both tests but in the level one test, you're primarily testing the ability of the aerobic system to recover. Whereas in a level two test, you're testing the ability of the anaerobic system to recover. Now, 
again, as I said, it's relative to the ability of the players. Is um, the recovery time the same? The recovery time is exactly okay. the same. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. Just I got that you. With the level two. Now, the, the, the stages like the, the, and the corresponding speeds are also the same. Meaning if you take the level one test and you get to, you know, if you're in good shape and you get to stage 20 or 21, the speed at stage 20 or 21 is the same as stage 20 or 21 on the level two. The speed is the same. It's yeah. just that in level one, you know, you start at stage five and from stage 14 onward, there are eight runs. And in each stage, you increase by 0 0.5 kilometers per hour. So it's a gradual increase. It's, it takes longer. Level two, you start at stage 11 and very quickly you get up to stage 19. So it's just much faster. And when I say this has to be relevant to the ability of the players and the level of play, typically in the top levels of soccer, um, on, on the female side, only the level one test is used regardless of level. And the reason, and again, it's not all men, not all women, but, but there are more or less at the top level, of course, there, you know, men are, are gonna be a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, a little bit faster. So if you were to use the level two test with female players, even at the top level, most of them would probably drop out around the same exact stage. So what you do is you actually lose some you know, validity and reliability if you use that test with female players. So with females, level one is always used. With men, depending on the fitness level, because if you have men that are not fit, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But if you have you know, men, uh, male players that are in good shape and training hard, typically around age U16, maybe U17 and up, the level two test is preferred. And the reason that the level two test is preferred is because very fit male players on the level one test may end up getting to stage 21, 22, 23, and they have to run for 20 to 25 minutes. It's just a lot of slow running that doesn't necessarily help you differentiate between fitness levels of top players. So I don't know if that was a, kind of went yeah. all over the place with that one. I, ho I hope that makes sense. So yes, Level one is more of a measure of aerobic capacity and level two is more of a measure of anaerobic capacity. However, you have to take into account the fitness level of who you're testing. And uh, really, as I said, in, in top soccer, females will always do the level one test. Males will do the level one up to about 16, 17. And then, because again, we assume that by that age, the men are going to be you know, literally taller, yeah. wider shoulders, bigger lungs, stronger heart, bigger legs more testosterone so they can handle the higher speeds. And, um, and it's a more, you know, it is a more valid and reliable test for, for men 17 and up. Nice. Awesome. Uh, this is all things that coaches can do and implement. What about from the player's perspective? Obviously players haven't had the training that they would have in a regular season where they're training three, four, five times a week. Yeah. Uh, they've been at home most of the time no matter how much Zoom sessions we do with them or give them tasks to do. So in terms of the player's perspective, now that we're returning to training to play, uh, what are some of the things that they can bring into their own uh, training to their, to their homes, the days when they're off? Is it complete recovery after a good training session? Is it going to be more of an active recovery? What are some of the things that they can do to to improve or to bring up their fitness levels to where the, where it was. Yeah, good. And, and I mean, I've, I've spoken quite a bit about this. I've done some, you know, some blogs and YouTube videos about it and, and, and nothing against, you know, of course, whether it was training on zoom or other types of, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of ball mastery work going on and, 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 and that's great. Um, the only challenge with that type of work, if we're talking physically is typically the intensity isn't going to be really high enough to stimulate, you know, the aerobic system and, and certainly not the anaerobic system. So, so there's nothing wrong with doing it, but supplemental to that. Um, and but I hope players would have already done this because now we're returning to play. So now they're getting back on the field, but in any case, you know, if you can't train uh, facilities are not open or whatever, and you're on your own, then it requires some running training. So the first thing is, uh, you know, running workouts and um, I'll go back to the nature of the activity in soccer. It's intermittent. There's a fast period, a rest, and then another fast period, and that's repeated. So um, what that looks like when you're running and doing running training is interval training. 
and and literally that means and and so maybe you guys have heard you know the the, the H I I T high intensity interval training that acronym. Coach Emanuele is a, is an expert on that. He's been that's right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know you guys you know all about it, right? But just for the audience, maybe or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Literally, we're talking a, an interval, a period of time where the intensity of exercise is very high, and then an interval where it's either lower or you're resting, and you repeat that. And so that that's the way soccer looks, and that's the best way to train. So with running, I mean, there's many ways to do it. I, again, I've, I've I've talked to about sort of my my favorite different types. Um, I think an interval, like the, the high intensity run, you, 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 could, you could go even as low as about 10 seconds, very, very fast. You could go even as high as about four minutes where of course you're not going to sprint for four minutes, but you can run, you know, a good fit player could, could cover a kilometer, let's say in four minutes, maybe more. Right. So, so, you know, anywhere from as low as 10 seconds to as long as four minutes and then a rest, period could be just rest just catching your breath could be running slower you know this just recovery running or whatever and a real great formula is just to have the the time of the run equal to the time of the rest so that means if you're going to run for 30 seconds very fast then you're going to rest for 30 seconds and then you're going to repeat that and that's what HIIT or high intensity interval training looks like i know maybe emanuele I'm oversimplifying. So sometimes these, um, if you go with a 10 second sprint, for example, it might not be realistic to rest only for 10 seconds. So I know that there's a great protocol uh, was done with cycling, but you know, a 10 second maximal effort and then a 20 second rest, and that's a 30 second block. And then you do that over and over again. So in any case, that's the kind of running that, you know, that, that we do in my facility. That's the kind of running we prescribe you know, we have an app that we use that, that helps them to customize and, and figure out, you know, if I'm running a three minute interval, how fast should I be going? How much distance should I be covering, etc. But really interval running, I mean, that's the best way to take care of the, the aerobic system, which is really, really important in soccer. Um, I'll speak briefly because I know you mentioned recovery. And that's another thing that like, I, I just don't think in youth soccer that there are many teams, you maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there are many teams that have a training session on the day after the game, right? You typically, you typically don't, right? It, it depends. It on depends. The yeah, it's, it varies a lot. It yeah, so, a so lot it, yeah, I mean, if, if you do, that's great. And you can work on recovery in your training, but like, yeah. maybe a lot of teams don't. And it's not, you know, maybe it's not even up to them. It's when you can get exactly. the results and, and whatever exactly. it is, right? So, yeah. but, but, but the day after a game is really important. And, and especially now, because we're dealing with, again, players that are coming from lower fitness than usual and less activity than usual. And, so when they start to play games, you know, the intensity of the games are going to be high no matter what. There's nothing you can do about that. So, so uh, you know, the risk of injury and stuff goes up. So the day after the game is, is, a, is a crucial period of time where you can recover, uh, but you have to do what's called active recovery. So, um, I mean, it might take me too long to give you all the details, but the basic idea with active recovery is a couple of things that, you, that are really useful to do. One is low intensity aerobic exercise. That's jogging slowly, riding an exercise bike slowly, some type of low, you know, don't go play squash or something, you know, but <laughs> do something low intensity, swimming, maybe things like that. Typically it's the cyclical movements like running, cycling, swimming, low intensity, anywhere from 10 up to 30 minutes. Um, core exercises, those are exercises to strengthen the, the middle of the body. What's your core? Your core is, you think of a human body, cut off the head, the two arms and the two legs. What's left is the core. So there's abdominal muscles, there's oblique muscles on the side, there's the lower back, the upper back. So exercises to strengthen those muscles. On your recovery day. On recovery, yeah. So yes. we got okay. low intensity cardiovascular exercise, we got core exercises, and then there's stretches and stretching is sort of a, you know, it's a controversial term sometimes these days, but the best type of stretches really are, are, are the ones that are more designed for mobility, where you would take muscles throughout a range of motion without really holding a stretch for too long. You can do some of the ones where you hold a stretch also. It's, it's okay on, on our recovery day, but maybe a combination of mobility, which is where you're stretching while moving, and just static flexibility, which is where you go into a stretch and hold it. Um, I mean if you don't want to come up with your own workout or whatever, things like yoga or Pilates are also great. I mean, there's a lot of professional soccer players that, that swear by yoga. Um, yeah. 
yoga is, if you look at it, it looks a lot like core strengthening and mobility. I mean, you know, there's, there's specific movements and things that are done there, but, but um, really like that, that 24 to 48 hours after a hard game is a real good time to do active recovery. So, you know, I think high intensity interval training a couple of days a week to build your fitness up and active recovery on the day after games. Those are both really, really useful. And are we talking for this because because of the pandemic, because it's important for them to do this? Or is this just in general, you would want them to have active recovery post games? Both uh, interval training and active recovery uh, are not would not be specific to the pandemic. They would be they would be useful to do all the time. And I think, mm-hmm. again, it, um, it's more about like when you're dealing with return to play like this is unique. No one's really we never experienced this before, but but. But really, the key is is managing the training load. So maybe active recovery right now might be a lot lower load. It might only be 15 minutes of running and you know a few things. Whereas you know if you're at a normal fitness level, you can kind of build it up and, and do more. But that's where kind of the, the the monitoring of training load really comes into play because without monitoring it, it's it's hard to know, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll say yeah. even about interval training, because this is like I, I speak a lot about this even you know, in, in university in one of the courses that I teach that, you know, just because you say run for four minutes and rest for four minutes. And even if you say, OK, run for four minutes and each of those has to be one kilometer. Right. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily tell you what the physiological response of the person was, because, again, like if you and I have a different fitness level and we both run a kilometer in four minutes, I might be dying and you might be fine. Yeah. And we don't know that unless we measure the physiological response. So, so that's why like monitoring training load, it's something that I really hammer in my courses because without it, you're kind of just guessing. And my opinion for coaching, for planning, coaching and training, guessing is not, not acceptable. So. <laughs> for sure. I was just curious because you're talking a lot about like hit training, endurance training, stuff like that. And I know like, especially as a player, I hated all of that. So I, um, like I had the worst endurance for a soccer player ever. Um, but it's also cause you know, there was never anything implemented to be like, here, how's you, you know, move forward. Here's how you get better at it. Anyways, I always noticed that my fitness levels were at their peak when I was doing a lot of weight and strength training, which is like what I love to do. Like it's one of my favorite things ever. Would you recommend that? And what are your thoughts on strength training? Okay. So that's, I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and I would say a hundred percent, I would not be surprised that, that you would have felt fitter and perform better when you were doing regular strength training. And um, I, 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 to be honest, um, didn't mention it. So I guess Sometimes in these courses that I teach, I, I do focus a bit more on, on training the energy systems, mainly because sometimes, you know, maybe we're dealing with a lot of coaches that are coaching younger kids and, and, and stuff. And, 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 you know, strength training has to be incorporated, especially weight training has to be incorporated a little more gradually with, with younger kids. There's nothing wrong with it. But um, regular strength training, and, and, and we can say it could be with weights, it could be with uh, resistance bands. It could be with body weight. All, all you need is you need muscles to work against resistance. The advantage of weights, of course, is that you can continue to add resistance as you get stronger. And there's very key, you know, uh, movements and muscles you can train with weights. But in any case, regular strength training is important for all athletes. And I'll say all ages. So there's nothing wrong. And if anyone who's listening, I mean, uh, maybe we can, we can put, put away the, the myth that, that strength training or weight training stunts your growth. Not only does it not stunt your growth, it actually causes the release of growth hormone and testosterone, which are hormones that help you grow. And any exercise where muscles work against resistance causes the release of those hormones. Soccer, you actually work against resistance quite a bit. There's resistance from opponents. There's resistance from stopping and starting on the ground. So in any case, um, strength training is really important. And um, absolutely, it should be part of the weekly routine of soccer players. In the course, we actually teach a module on... Now, we teach it because we're speaking again to coaches about kind of how to do it in their practice. So we teach more or less body weight strength training. And again, that's not because there's anything wrong with doing weights. It's just because we're trying to show things that can be done on the field in a little bit more practical way. Um, 
the only thing I would say with any type of, of strength training is that it's probably important for players to uh, get some type of professional instruction. Uh, so that they learn how to perform movements properly. Yeah. Sometimes you might see, um, you know, especially younger players, the first time they get into a gym, the first thing they want to do is try to see what's the heaviest weight they can lift. Yeah. And, you know, that isn't the best way to do it. It's, it's, it's so, so uh, I think it's, it's absolutely, and, and Fiona, I'm absolutely not surprised you know, that you said, like, you will, you will definitely see the athletes who are stronger, uh, they're going to get hurt less. They're going to run faster. And, and believe it or not, it even helps you with recovery. It, it helps your aerobic system to be stronger as well. So they all kind of tie in together. It's just, I would say that, that it's important to, to work with a, a strength and conditioning coach, a personal trainer, work with someone, especially when you're starting, that can teach you proper form and then teach you a little bit about how to add load and you know, when you get stronger so you don't hurt yourself. And to add on this, uh, Richard, when you were saying uh, strength training uh, on field, what would you do? Okay, I understand body weight, use maybe some balls if you have medicine ball. Let's say you don't have too much. Would you do more a strength training with maybe three to four reps of 10 to 12 exercise or, uh, sorry, rep, or more a circuit training, which involved also a little bit some cardio, but at the same time involve some resistance against Yeah, I, I always kind of liked using circuits if I was doing stuff on the field, just because, um, so, so as a general rule, you know, especially once you're not dealing with beginners anymore, body weight exercises, you know, they're good, but, you know, really um, to, to truly build strength in a muscle, you need a pretty heavy resistance. And it's hard to get a very heavy resistance from body weight. I mean, a, a typical top level soccer player should be able to do at least maybe 15, 20, 25 push-ups, you know? So it's like doing that amount of repetitions isn't quite a heavy enough load in order to build muscle, but it's, it can build endurance. It can build, you know, it can build, you know, um, well, I mean, endurance is the main thing and, and it can make muscles a little bit bigger as well. So in any case, if you, if you take exercises like that, push-ups, core exercises, lunges, single leg exercises for the legs, things like that, Um, and you put them into a circuit, literally just means you, you perform one after the other after the other without resting, you get muscular endurance. So you build endurance in the muscles. You get a little bit of strength as well from it, of course. And you also raise the heart rate. So you get a stimulus to the aerobic system, to the cardiovascular system as well. So it's kind of a, yeah, it's, a, it's an efficient way to train. So I always like to do circuits with body weight exercises. Uh, For a top athlete, for an athlete that's thinking, you know, to play co competitive soccer beyond high school, university, whatever, that type of training isn't going to replace weight training. And yeah. the reason it isn't going to is because really to make muscles bigger and stronger, again, once you're not a beginner anymore, you need heavier weight. A top level, just as an example, right? Like a top level female soccer player should be able to squat at least squat with their own body weight, if not up to 1.5 times their body weight. And a top level male player should be between 1.5 up to two. Soccer players don't always have the ability to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but it's interesting. If you look at other sports, male or female, I'll give rugby as an example. And, uh, you know, people look at rugby and they kind of think, well, it's very different to soccer. And it is. But the back players, the backs in a full field rugby game, they run almost as much as a soccer player does, as fast and as much which means they have a strong aerobic system. But there isn't one top female rugby player that can't squat 1.5 times their own body weight. There isn't one. Whereas there's lots of females on the soccer side. And, and same thing with the males. Every single one can squat two times their body weight. And there's a lot of top male players that can't do that. Some of them don't lift weights at all. Yeah. And, and again, you can still get to the top level and be a little bit weaker. It just means you're a little bit more prone to injury. That's all. So, so circuit training can be, it's good, but it's supplemental to weight training with, with higher level players. Doesn't yeah. replace I, I've done circuit training a little bit with the OPDL boys a couple of times. They, they, they hate it at the moment, but I get good feedback from it. But yeah. uh, going back to strength training, like I was doing my residential for my football degree a couple of years ago in the UK. And uh, there was two 
main uh, exercises that we literally focused on for like over a week, which was deadlift and squats, because the benefits of those two strength training exercises is massive. Like uh, mine was the deadlifts. So, the, so we literally had professionals teaching us the right forms and then how to add weights to it and the benefits of it and acceleration and re- prevention of injuries, stuff like that. So it's, it's really massive. And yeah, nice yeah, to see. yeah. yeah. And, and I'll say like, like, again, like, like what, why do we train, you know, whether it's running training or weight, you know, training is done for two reasons. It's done to decrease risk of injury and yeah. to optimize performance. So yeah strength training is is really is designed to make muscles bigger and stronger and and, you know deadlift squats i mean these are key exercises for any athlete because they focus on the big muscles in the legs lower back etc and so if we're going to talk decreasing injury well i mean the evidence is very clear a muscle that is stronger is much more resistant to fatigue and is also much more resilient when it's put under you know a, a high amount of strain Soccer players, I mean, if two players go head to head, you know, anything can happen, anyone can get hurt, and there's nothing you can do. But that's not the way all injuries happen in soccer. There's lots of injuries in soccer that happen when there's no ball around or when there's no opponent, when you're just running and you change direction. And this is, I mean, a good example might be the ACL tears, anterior cruciate ligament tears. They're more common in, in women than in men, but in soccer, it's a very common injury. And typically, that injury is very much preventable if you do proper strength training so strength training again it's there's a very clear relationship with injury prevention and then the second reason to train is to improve performance and again you touched on it Shaneen so um, sprinting especially uh, accelerating which is starting from zero and going and again most of the runs that are done in soccer are not you know you don't run 100 meters in soccer you run five, 10, you know, the average distance of a so, yeah. 10 to 20 meters. So they're short, a few yeah. seconds. There's a lot of those runs that are done in a game. And the performance of those runs, one of the key, you know, determining factors is strength because strength leads to force output. The harder, you know, the more force you can produce, the harder you can push into the ground, the quicker you're going to accelerate. So there's also a very key, actually, and in, in, in my PhD right now, I'm, I'm, I'm looking into this in a lot of detail, right? But, you know, more or less, the, I mean, the, the research is clear. The evidence is clear. There's a very key relationship between strength and performance of short distance sprinting. And of course, if you can imagine, you know, if a soccer player does a good strength program and they become a little bit faster over shorter distances, it's not just that they're faster. They're going to perform better because they're going to outrun other people. And, you know, speed is not the only thing that matters in, in soccer or in any other sport, but it's very important. And we, we work very hard in our facility just to make improvements of about one to five hundredths of a second in a small sprint. So that means if we measure you over 10 meters and you run it at, you know, 1.85 seconds and then we train you and we get you down to 1.81 or 1.82, it doesn't sound like anything, but a hundredth of a second is about one step. And if wow. you're one step faster than you were before, now all of a sudden you're getting to balls that you couldn't get to before. So you do get a, a very clear reduction of injury risk and you do get a very clear improvement in performance from strength training. But as you said, and I think Fiona, we touched on this as well, is you need to work with a person who knows what they're doing to teach you. So that you don't hurt because because of course if you try to lift heavy weights and you don't know what you're doing you, you're, you're guaranteed to get hurt i won't even say like it's it's yeah. it's not a good idea so you need to learn how to do it properly and then and then add it to your routine yeah. do you implement any weight training in your facility or is it all just endurance and sprinting and things like that we we have we have a full setup squat cage olympic station dumbbells and everything so we we do it all um, with younger athletes, the focus is a lot more on the aerobic system and a little bit of incorporation of speed and plyometrics. We do strength training with younger athletes. We, we teach them how to do a goblet squat, holding a dumbbell in front of their chest, and we do push-ups and other kind of simple core exercises. Older athletes, um, weight training is part of the routine. And again, we, we, uh, we don't really do a lot of deadlifting and it's not that I don't like it. It's just that like for, for time constraints, we kind of, we kind of focus on, on squatting more than deadlift, nothing wrong with it, but 
just just an opinion. Um, and 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 but but yes, weight training is, is part of the routine for for the older athletes. And uh, Richard, on this, uh, um, because you don't do maybe too many deadlifts, do you think uh, the Nordic uh, hamstring curl exercise it's helpful for injury prevention? Of course, strengthen the hamstring. Like because I heard it's more kind of body weight exercise. Of course, you can use also different resistance band and so on. What do you think about uh, that type of exercise? Yeah, so that's it's a really interesting one, and, and um, I mean it's um, it's used in the in the FIFA 11 uh, plus uh, protocol, which which is which is Correct. a great protocol for injury prevention. And of course, you know I, I mentioned about kind of you know uh, I mean the, the FIFA 11 plus it's it's, it's used as a warm up in the beginning of training, but it has running training, it also has mobility training, and it also has strength training. And and one of the key exercises is is, is the Nordic curl. And just to be clear, maybe people are watching and don't know if you're on your knees, you know, this would be your torso here and, and you use your hamstring muscles to slow, you fall to the ground, but you use the hamstring muscles to, to slow down the fall basically. Now, is why this is the one where like you might have somebody holding your feet? Oh, oh yes. So you, actually, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. You're on your knees and you have to have someone behind yeah. you <laughs> putting their body weight on your ankles, yeah. you know, on your calf muscles, basically, because, because without that, then <laughs> you're going you know, to fall. You're just going to tip over. Uh, yeah. we're, not, we're not, we're not built that way. We're too top heavy. So, so you have to have someone holding you down, but you basically just slow your descent to the ground and, and the hamstrings are, are, are working to slow you down. Um, the, the one thing, and, and this is like, I, I, I'm, I, I am a instructor for FIFA 11. So they, like, they were really clear with us about this and I have to be clear. It's not done to try to show off and see how long you can go before you fall. That's like, if you start doing that, you really can overload the hamstrings very quickly. What it's meant to be, it's meant to be about a three to four second continuous drop. And if you can imagine, if you didn't use your hamstrings at all and you just fell, you'd fall in one second. I mean, you'd fall very fast. So if you can imagine, it's literally four seconds to get from here to here, but continuous speed. So it's one, two, three, four, like that. Okay. Anyway, mm -hmm. the hamstrings contract eccentrically, meaning they produce force or they're under tension as they're lengthening. Okay. Um, that type of muscle action is used a lot in soccer and other sports, but especially that muscle action in the hamstring, it's used all the time in soccer. And if you can imagine every time you run, I mean, I'm going to use my hands to show you, but every time you run, you lift your knee up and then your leg, you know, your hip and your knee start to extend forward. It's actually the hamstrings that control the extension of the leg as it extends, as, as it moves forward and then starts to come towards the ground. So the hamstrings contract eccentrically to control the leg as it's moving when you're running, sprinting. Yeah. They work the same way when you're striking a ball. Any type of powerful, you know, whether it's a goalkeeper, like a goal kick, drop kick, a shot on goal, a free kick, whatever it is, the leg is swinging forward and the hamstring is contracting eccentrically to control or slow down the, or else, you know, your, your leg would just fly off if you didn't have any hamstring action. Right. So, so in any case, so because that's such a key action and a key movement in soccer, using this exercise to train it is really, really effective. And, and, you know, it is a body weight exercise, but it's one of those exercises that actually you can get a pretty high load with only a few repetitions. Even in FIFA 11, they never recommend more than eight repetitions. And they actually recommend starting with four. And you'll, you'll notice if you try it, I mean, if you do two or three sets of four repetitions, it, it, you know, it causes quite a lot of fatigue in the hamstrings, even without a weight. Then there's you know, stronger athletes that can start to hold a little weight on their chest or something as they fall. But in any case, it's very useful because it's training a specific movement for, for sports and for soccer. And um, there's quite a lot of evidence to show that that exercise is useful in preventing hamstring injuries. And it's for that reason, because you strengthen the hamstring eccentrically with that movement. And then when you have to do those movements in the game, the muscle is much more prepared. So I like it. And I would say, go, you know, and, and it's a good one. You know, again, you can do it uh, without weight and you can do it on a field. So it's, it's a good one to include. In, in maybe in your body weight training on the field, even in, in, even in a circuit training, it's an excellent one to include. Can you do the opposite of that to work the quads? Is that, is that something? You, so 
um, believe it or not, like if, if you imagine literally the opposite movement, so you're on your knees and you yeah. kind of extend your back backward. First of all, you don't need anybody holding you. You do it on yeah. your own. Yeah. Um, you don't train the quadriceps quite so much with that as you do the core muscles. Hmm, and there is a little bit of activation in the highest part of the quadricep. It's the rectus femoris, but it's primarily a kind of a core and a, even a lower back. Like it, it's, 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 a, it's a good exercise to do. Um, the other thing is uh, I wouldn't ever advise you to go all the way back and fall. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're probably going to hurt yourself. But yeah. if you try, um, you know, if you try to start perpendicular to the ground and then extend back until you're almost at a 45 degree angle and come back and hold that and then come back what you'll notice is it, um, it, it's just it's just because of the you know the the, the angles that you're using and, and and the way the muscles are i mean you're not going to feel so much in the thigh and the quadricep you're going to feel much more near the hip and, and the core uh, okay. but in any case it, it is a, it's a very quite a useful uh, core exercise and uh yeah you can you can you can fall down and then fall back and and, and, and throw them both into a circuit nothing wrong with that and nice. to add to this one, would you do the strength during an, um, the session, during a training session? Would you do a strength training before maybe a cardio training or some maybe small side game that you can use as a cardio? Or would you do maybe opposite way, maybe a cardio first uh, strength training? Because for what uh, I know, for what I'm understanding, probably cardio training sometimes give you more fatigue. Yeah. So if you're going to do strength training after, you might not be as fresh. So what's your idea or opinion on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And, and, and this is, it's, it's a little bit of a debate because I don't think there's a right or a wrong way. So, okay. so the, the one thing I would say to answer it is it depends on what the focus of the training is. What, what's, uh, what the fo what, what's the priority? So if the priority is the, the energy system or whatever you're doing on the field and you do strength training before that, it depends if, this, if there's too much heavy lifting or whatever, and then you go and run or, or play, it may affect the, you know, the, the intensity and, and, and the overall, uh, let's say, stimulus to the aerobic system. So that's okay if your focus was strength training, no problem. And again, lots of you know, pros do it and lots of top teams, they'll have a lifting session. Sometimes they'll lift in the morning and then maybe have a break. Yeah. And then after lunch, they'll train. Like, I, I don't know that I really like, I mean, I, I, I I've done it a few times and I know how it feels. So it, it, a heavy lift and then going right away to play. I, like, I don't like that I, 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 because there's, there's quite a lot of fatigue in the muscles. You can't quite sprint, you know, you, you get a little tired and, you know, so I, but, but then again, there's lots of other lifting sessions where the focus is a little bit more on power. Um, you know, and, and again, as I said, lots of pros, uh, you know, they'll do that and they'll go train right away or they'll train later in the day. So, so that's, but then, you know, you got to understand then you're prioritizing strength, nothing wrong with it, but that's what you're doing. Um, if the priority is, you know, the work on the field, which often is the case, then you're going to do the field work first and then you go into the gym and, and again, you're prioritizing the energy system. So you may be a little bit tired. You might not be able to lift as heavy. I mean, of course, if you have, if you want to squat, you know, you know, the heaviest weight you can lift five times, you warm up and then you do that, or you warm up, you play a 90 minute training session and then you do it. Of course, after the 90 minute training, so you, you may not be able to, you might have to take the weight down by 20 pounds or 30. Yeah. That's the way it is, but it's just about what the priority is. So this is sort of like where the art of, you know, planning training comes into it. There isn't a right or a wrong way. It just, you know, it depends on, on you know, what's the priority. Me personally, like, I, you know, I, I, I like uh, weight training and strength training, but if we're dealing with in a preseason or in season and all my work, like, you know, with, with, uh, with the Ottawa Fury, with, uh, with the national team, with TFC, you know, my, the work that I did at the higher levels, um, I typically prioritize the energy system a bit more if it was preseason or in season. Off season, we did, you know, some heavier lifting and, you know, and, and, and again, this is a debate. Like there are some coaches out there, even conditioning coaches that, that, that don't really like the idea of lifting weights in season. And the reason is because in order to make a muscle stronger, you need heavy lifting. Yeah. Heavy lifting causes soreness. Soreness interrupts training on the field. So it's not like a, it's not a binary thing. It's not black and white, but that's sort of the reason or the rationale why, why some coaches don't. I do like to lift weights in season, but in season, I prioritize the 
work on the field and then we lift. And even if they lift a bit lighter weight, it's okay. Because to me, building strength, I like to do it in a time when there isn't a lot of soccer training or games. And then I like to maintain it in the season, but that's me. So yep. anyway. <laughs> You know, we're talking a lot about fitness and I think a really important part of fitness is food. Like I personally think it's one of the more important parts of being, you know, fit, whatever. Um, what misconceptions about food have you like experienced within your career or whatever that you still hear now that like what athletes should be eating, what athletes shouldn't be eating, you know, there's the whole don't eat complex carbs, like stuff like that. Like what, yeah. what have you, I feel like you've experienced a lot and you've, you've gone through all of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's a good question. And, and, and I, I agree with you. Um, it's hard to quantify the contribution that diet makes, but, but what I would say is a soccer player with a poor diet, isn't going to have a long and healthy career. Like, like we'll just say, you know, some people can get away with, I mean, I, you know, crazy things in university or whatever, when they're young, but eventually um, bad habits catch up to you. So diet and you know, nutrition and everything, it's very important, of course, to prevent injury and to improve performance. It's very important. Now, about misconceptions. So I think you kind of touched on it, Fiona. So I, like, I'll say that um, low carbohydrate diets or in the extreme case, no carbohydrate, you know, like, which, which do exist, right? Um, now, I, I don't like them for, for anybody and, 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 and when we're talking athletes, they're impossible. So let me tell you first why I don't like low carbohydrate diets for anybody. You need energy to exercise. And of course the energy to exercise comes from the food that you eat. The higher the intensity of the exercise, and this is relative to your capacity. If you're not in shape, going for a jog is a high intensity workout for you. But if you're an athlete, you know, then it's a soccer game or a soccer, whatever it is. But Higher, the higher the intensity of the exercise, the greater the reliance on carbohydrates as energy. So when you're doing very high intense exercise, which soccer is, yeah. average heart rates in soccer are almost never lower than about 70 to 75% of maximum heart rate, almost never. And they're typically, you know, the fitter you are, the closer you are to maximum. Okay. So when you do intense exercise, you need carbohydrates as energy. There is nothing else your body can use for energy. So again, just general person, everyday person that, you know, if an everyday person wants to exercise and they should, because exercising is what keeps you healthy, keeps your weight down, keep, you know, keeps you mobile. I mean, everyone should exercise. And really, you know, again, it's my opinion. I'm a little biased about this, but people should strive to do as high intense exercise as they can. It's better for you. It's not a good idea to say, well, I'm not an athlete, so I'm just going to go for walks. And okay, that's okay. I understand that. But if you can still handle a, 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 a HIIT workout, do that. It's much better than just a walk. For, and, 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 the, and the research is clear on this. It's not just me saying it's better. You get a, a, a greater adaptations to the heart muscle. You get uh, you know, all kinds of physiological adapta adaptations and changes in the muscle. You, you, again, you lose more fat with HIIT training. You, you, there's, there's, a, there's a window of time when the workout is over, where you burn more calories throughout the day. You gain more muscle. High intensity training is always better than low intensity training. And since you know, we know that, then I would say for anybody, you want to make sure you're eating the food that's gonna give you energy that will allow you to perform high intensity exercise. So for anybody, you need to have enough. And, and, and by the way, that food is complex carbohydrates. Those are the, you know, whatever it is, whether it's bread or pasta or cereal or rice, or, you know, there's many different forms. So in any case, if your diet is too low in complex carbohydrates, then you cannot perform high intensity exercise. And that means you're going to decrease the intensity of your exercise. And I don't like that. So for everybody, they need a certain amount of carbohydrates. Now, athletes, Every single exercise that they do is high intensity. The only time that it isn't is on the day after the game, the recovery day. Like a top level soccer player. And again, we're trying to prepare these children for at least to play in college or university. And some of them, maybe the best ones, hopefully we prepare them to play you know, professionally or, or with a national team if they're good enough, right? 
That means you train every day at a high intensity. The only possible source of fuel is carbohydrates. So not only do you not want to limit them, you actually need to eat a lot. And, and again, I, I've done, I've done, you know, quite a bit of work on this, um, even with my, with my PhD, looking into carbohydrate supplementation, I, I will almost guarantee you that if you, if you guys look at the, you know, the players that you coach, if they just started to add consistently more carbohydrates in their diet throughout the day, you'd notice a host of improvements right away. They they'd play better, they train better, they train harder, they'd get less tired, they'd recover better, they'd sleep better. There's a whole host of you know, physical and physiological adaptations that you get from a high carbohydrate diet. It's really, really important. And if you, you know, even with a high carbohydrate diet, it can be difficult to keep the energy stores that you need in soccer up to the levels that they are. There's some research that's shown that even when players have, so without getting into all the details, glycogen is the stored version of carbohydrate. So you eat it, it gets broken down into sugar, and then it gets converted into glycogen and your muscles store glycogen. So you have a certain amount in your quadriceps and glutes and calves and everything. So when you exercise at a high intensity, you use that glycogen. So there's research that's shown sometimes in a, in a 90 minute soccer game, even when players are muscle glycogen is as high as it can be before the game that it goes down to less than 20 percent which means they lose 80 maybe up to 90 percent of their energy in one game even with a high carbohydrate diet and yeah. so what does that mean that means well okay the next day is recovery you can maybe put a little bit back but then you got to start training again so you're kind of as a soccer player you're kind of always in this fight against depleting glycogen it goes up, goes back down. It goes up. It's like a like a video game, uh, you know, where the power meter, you know, goes. So you're and, and if it goes too low, well, okay, your your muscles can't work at a high intensity without glycogen. And so yeah, that's and a that's a yeah. Sorry, that's a that's a key. It's a myth. Low carbohydrate diets are. Uh, uh, it, it is it is not possible for a soccer player to perform with a low carbohydrate diet. Yeah, and I'll kind of piggyback onto what I was saying before. But would you? For let's let's do specific to soccer. Um, would you recommend they eat in a caloric surplus at maintenance or in a deficit, or would you just recommend those for whatever their specific goal is? Like if a coach was trying to, you know, make sure that their players were eating at a like a clean whatever whatever their goal is. Like what would you recommend for players? So um, the as as a general rule, um, like. I'll, I'll get into the general rule and then I'll talk maybe specifically about kind of carbohydrate deficits and all that. So as a general rule, you need a lot of carbohydrates and you need them all the time. So, um, you know, when we, when I worked like with, you know, higher level players and stuff, more or less, we told them that they had to get between 10 to 12 servings of carbohydrates per day. And those would be spread out across the day, you know, four meals and a snack or whatever it is. So the, the, the basic idea is again, you're using carbohydrates when you exercise, you're using them when you recover from exercise. And then of course you're using them kind of throughout the day. So if you put them back in throughout the day, that's sort of the best way to do it overall. Um, there is some interesting research into kind of, I won't get into fasting because that's also interesting, but I, like to me, fasting is not practical for athletes. It's very interesting for the general population. It's not practical for athletes because athletes are, are training all the time. You can't, can't go 10, 12 hours without eating. But in any case, um, some research that's worked with athletes uh, where they'll, they'll limit the consumption of carbohydrates over a certain period of time and then feed more later on. Um, I reviewed some papers on this a couple of years ago. And so I, I may be out to date, uh, 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 dated, but, but, but from what I saw that the evidence was kind of like, it was equivocal. Like th there wasn't a consensus. There were some studies that showed with endurance runners that they got some better performance from this, like, you know, different timing of carbohydrate intake and other studies that showed that they didn't. It's tricky because there's so many other factors that come into play, how much sleep athletes are getting, how hard they train, um, psychological factors that can affect performance, etc. Right. So in any case, I don't really like, especially like we're talking with youth athletes here, you know, you, you guys are a youth club and, and you know, these, these athletes are not 
like they're not taking care of the basic things like like you know they're, they're probably not eating enough fruits and vegetables they're probably not drinking enough water they're probably not sleeping enough um i know right now they're not exercising enough let's hope that they start but so these are like it's so without getting into kind of different timing of carbohydrate intake for youth athletes just give them lots of carbs and have them you know feed with carbohydrates consistently throughout the day if there's a top level athlete who has kind of taken care of all of those basic things that's when i would start to look into okay let's look let's look at the research into you know timing of carbohydrate intake and then you, you probably have to work with a dietitian or, or someone that can really supervise you and say okay let's try it why don't we try it for, for a few weeks and, and see what happens it's the same exact approach that I would take with any type of nutritional supplement. And that's another thing I know you kind of asked me about misconceptions and stuff. So, so there are some supplements that, that, that really work. Caffeine is one of them. Creatine is another one. Like the, the, I mean, the, the, they're, they're clearly they're effective and they're safe. But if, again, like if you're not training properly and you're not, you know, <laughs> having a citrus fruit every day and you're not getting you know, enough protein. Like if you're not getting like the simple things, but you're taking a caffeine or a creatine or a protein shaker, like it's, it's like you're putting the cart before the horse. So for me, it's like, you got to take care of all the simple things first. And, and, and again, like with the national team, we, there was a, almost a, a customized plan for each player for hydration. Again, a lot of them were using caffeine and again, there's nothing wrong with it, but, but this, these were athletes at the national team, right? They're already training optimally. They're already getting almost 10 hours of sleep a night, literally in bed at 10 and, you know, up at seven or eight o'clock. Right. So, so they're, they're taking care of everything. And then these little things add a little bit of an edge. So I don't know if that answers your yeah, question. At, at that level, I think they take their dietary intakes and they, they literally like at a very detailed level, they look at everything they need to eat to be able to, specialize it for every single athlete so yeah but for yeah. for us for our uh, purpose i think because we are a youth club for our players just like richard said i think just taking care of those basic stuff carbohydrates before game days or before heavy training maybe carbohydrates all, all the time all the time before yeah after, after, after yeah exactly exactly yeah. i actually talked to my players a couple of weeks ago about this so i'm glad this came up thank you fiona for bringing it up but yeah thanks a lot richard i want to be conscious of time i know we're past 12 oh, yeah. now it's been over an hour so if if you guys have any other questions manu fiona or richard if there's anything you want to touch on that we didn't mention maybe just to, to add on one more thing fiona with your question because i i think this is something that, that maybe comes up sometimes with regards to nutrition for athletes if you have an athlete that's maybe a little bit overweight this is something that i think comes up and it's maybe it's worth mentioning um so um I think that uh, if, if that happens and, and you're speaking to a parent or something, I mean, of course, you know, soccer is about performance more than it's about, you know, how you look or whatever. So, you know, even if a player is carrying a bit more body fat, it's not really a big, big deal. But if you've got someone who you suspect is carrying more body fat than is optimal for them athletically, then probably nutrition and diet is a, is, is a, is a factor at least that you want to consider. And so, um, what I, what I like to do in those cases is break it down a little bit more step by step. So you, you start by taking a diet log and you look at how many servings of the different nutrients they're getting. Oftentimes you're going to find if someone's overweight, it's probably, you know, there's too many days of the week where they're eating, you know, chocolates and chips and th things like that, that, that are easy to kind of cut out. And what you can try to do then is, is just cut down the calories maybe by a few hundred every day without really worrying like you still need a lot of carbohydrates you still need you know everything that you need but you just try to cut out a few hundred calories a day and then over time gradually then you're going to get these players to lose a little bit of body fat and, and 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 then all of a sudden you know being overweight doesn't become such a problem anymore and i think uh that's that's something i've like i've, I've done quite a bit with, with with athletes you know here and there when when their parents will, will approach me about about this topic it's a bit of a sensitive topic but I think that the first thing is that if there is anyone who, you know, who's, who's overweight or concerned about that, the first thing you look at is their performance. So if they're playing well, if they're running a lot, if their fitness scores are high and they've got a little bit of extra body fat, honestly, I, like, I, I don't really care, you know, 
if they're not, like if they're every game, they're getting tired after 20 minutes and, you know, it's clearly they're not running as fast as they could. Maybe they're picking up injuries and, you know, things like that. Then it's affecting performance. Then that's when I would kind of think about intervening, but I would intervene with a diet log and then starting to find ways to cut out a few hundred calories a day. If you can cut out about, you know, maybe 300 calories a day or something like that, you can, you can get to the point where you can lose about a pound of fat in a week and you can lose, you know, over a few months, you can lose 10 pounds and then you're good. So anyway, just thought I'd mention that because I think it might be something people think about with regards to nutrition. So. No, no, for sure. I think every coach probably comes across this situation like this. So great point. Thanks. Thanks for bringing it up. All right. Thank you, Richard. I really, really appreciate it. Very, very informative. Like I just learned so much right now myself. So I hope listeners, viewers can also get something from it. Thank you for your time. I really hope to see you on the field sometime, maybe uh, get to know you a little bit more, enroll in some of the courses that you offer. So thanks a lot for your time and I hope to see you sometime soon.